After the nasal bones, the zygoma is the most commonly fractured bone in the face. The zygoma serves as a shock absorber for the cranium to absorb any forces and for this reason it is in a prominent position in the face. A zygomatic fracture may occur alone or in combination with other facial bone fractures. An orbital floor fracture may complicate a zygomatic fracture. As with mandibular fractures, the commonest cause is interpersonal violence. The zygoma is a complex bone as it articulates at several places with other bones. The black line shows the zygomaticofrontal suture, or ZF suture, which is the point of contact between the zygoma and the frontal bone. The green line shows the suture between the zygoma and the zygomatic arch, which is a projection of the temporal bone. The zygoma also joins with the sphenoid bone and the maxilla. This is a plastic skull and the features are not very accurate, and the infraorbital rim is usually more prominent. The zygoma also joins with the maxilla at the zygomatico-maxillary suture, or the buttress as it's more commonly known. Looking at the skull, do note the proximity of the infraorbital foramen. This is a lateral view of the skull, once again showing the sutures. The sutures are a weak area, and because of this, they are the most frequent site to fracture. By virtue of the shape and complex attachments of the zygoma, fractures commonly involve several sutures. There have been several attempts to classify zygomatic fractures, and most are based on the location of the fracture sites. It is worth looking these up. The orbital floor is the thinnest bone of the orbit and is therefore the most commonly fractured bone of the orbit. A blow to the globe itself may cause an orbital floor fracture, the classic injury being a squash ball travelling at speed which hits the front of the globe and fractures the orbital floor. Orbital floor injuries may occur in combination with zygomatic fractures, especially if the infraorbital rim is breached. A fractured floor may cause a trap door effect, and there may be herniation of the orbital contents. In adults, an orbital floor fracture is normally an injury that does not require admission. In children, this same injury is serious and is treated quite differently. If any orbital contents are trapped in the fracture, then the oculocardiac reflex may occur. This is a decrease in pulse rate associated with the traction applied to the extraocular muscles or compression of the eyeball. The reflex is mediated by connections between the trigeminal nerve and the vagus nerve. This reflex is especially sensitive in neonates and children, but can also occur in adults. Bradycardia, asystole and very rarely death can be induced through this reflex. This condition can be initially treated medically with atropine, but essentially needs urgent surgery. Contact your second on-call immediately if a child presents with an orbital floor fracture. As with the fractured mandible, you must always apply ATLS principles. A blow to the zygoma may also cause a head injury or damage to the cervical spine, and you must ensure that these have been assessed and ruled out by the accident and emergency doctors before accepting the patient. In addition, you must consider the eye and assess it formally. Interpersonal violence is often fueled by drugs or alcohol, so your patient may well be under the influence. Your history should be documented completely and accurately, bearing in mind all the points listed here. You must not speculate and only document what the patient tells you, your examination findings and the results of medical tests. Bear in mind that at a later date you might be requested to write a police statement regarding your findings and even be a witness of fact at a court hearing. The classical symptoms are pain, double vision or blurred vision, and altered sensation in the distribution of the infraorbital nerve, which manifests itself as numbness of the cheek, lateral aspect of the nose and maxillary teeth on the ipsilateral side of the fracture. These are some of the clinical signs you may see in a patient with a zygomatic fracture. Subconjunctival hemorrhage is bleeding beneath the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva contains many small fragile vessels that are easily broken and when this happens, blood leaks into the space between the conjunctiva and the sclera, giving a bright red colour. It may look very striking, 
but is usually nothing to be concerned about. But please remember that subconjunctival hemorrhage also occurs in base of skull fractures and globe injuries. The patient in the lower photograph obviously has a flattened contour on the right hand side of his face and extensive periorbital bruising or ecchymosis, sufficient to close the palpable fissure. Examine the patient from the side, the front and superiorly, palpating the bones of the orbit and the zygomatic arch. Palpate the buttress from inside the mouth and at the same time be sure to check the palate for signs of injury and bruising. You must document your findings. Remember, if you didn't document it, then it never really happened. These are two different patients with restricted eye movement caused by orbital fractures and on the right is an excerpt from the medical notes recording their clinical findings. In the upper photograph, the patient has been asked to look upwards. The left eye is restricted and cannot move. Double vision occurs in the field of vision as recorded in the grid by the Roman numeral 2. In the lower photograph, the patient is asked to look left. The left eye remains stationary. It has subconjunctival hemorrhage and chemosis. Diplopia is universal in almost all fields of vision. Some orbital floor fractures can result in diplopia. As previously mentioned, the fracture creates a trap door effect that can trap the orbital contents. Frank impingement of the inferior rectus muscle is quite rare, but entrapment of the fatty tissue beneath this muscle is much more common, and this alone is enough to restrict eye movement. You must remember that the size of the orbital floor defect does not correlate well with clinical signs. A small fracture may cause significant diplopia, but a large fracture may not cause any restriction of eye movement at all. It is essential to document these findings. Visual acuity must be recorded using a Snellen chart. Relative position of the eyes should be recorded and whether or not they are reactive to light. PEARL or PEARLA are acronyms meaning pupils equal and reactive to light. The palpable fissure is the anatomical name for the separation between the upper and lower eyelids. You should record whether the palpable fissure is normal, decreased or closed. Radiographs are essential if a fracture is suspected. A rule of thumb in orthopaedics is to take two views of a fracture at approximately 90 degrees apart. This isn't quite possible with the face, but occipital mental views at 10 and 30 degrees or 0 and 30 degrees usually suffice. In addition, submental vertex views are good at demonstrating the zygomatic arches, but some centres are reluctant to perform them. Occipital mental views can be difficult to read initially as the facial skeleton and cranium are composed of many bones which superimpose each other and can cause some confusion. However, by applying a few simple rules you will soon be comfortable with them. These are Brown's lines and they emphasise that the best way to read an OM view is to compare one side with the other. When you read an OM view, start from the top and work your way down. The blue line demarcates the superior orbital rim and the ZF suture. Trace this with your finger or a pen. Do the same for the red line, which indicates the nasal bones, inferior orbital rim and zygomatic arch. The yellow line highlights the maxilla, buttress and zygomatic arch. For each line, compare them with the left and the right and look for bony steps and asymmetry. Be mindful that the radiographer might not always be able to position the patient ideally, especially if they are inebriated. In this situation, the head may be turned one way and make side-to-side -side comparison difficult. The 30-degree occipital mental view is very good for assessing the red and yellow lines and any breach of the infraorbital rim is usually demonstrated nicely. It is less useful for displaying fractures of the supraorbital rim. Apply Brown's lines to this zero degree OM view. A step at the ZF suture is obvious on the left side, as is the step on the infraorbital rim. Now look at the position of the stars which are placed at the tip of the coronoids of the mandible. Note how on the left side the coronoid is superimposed by the zygoma, indicating inferior displacement of it. This is a common occurrence and something you should look out for. Lastly, look at the maxillary antrum on the left side. It is irregular and opacified at the inferior aspect, which indicates a collection of fluid, in this case blood, caused by the broken bone. 
This is also a common occurrence and you may even see it in undisplaced fractures of the zygoma. This is a 30 degree OM view of the same patient. The infraorbital step is clearly visible but notice how the ZF step is less visible. This is a 10 degree view of a different patient. Fractures can clearly be seen at the ZF, the arch and the buttress. The infraorbital rim looks relatively intact. But the 30 degree film also shows a step in the lateral aspects of the infraorbital rim. This is another patient and is a 10 degree film showing a complex fracture. The fracture of the buttress has propagated up the zygoma to involve the lateral aspect of the orbit. As mentioned previously, the fracture doesn't always affect the sutures and here the ZF suture is intact but the infraorbital rim is fractured. This is a 30 degree view of the same patient showing a similar pattern. The vast majority of fractured zygomas do not need admission. As long as you are happy with the eye and there are no other significant injuries and the patient can be sent home, simply clean and suture any lacerations, take the patient's details and then book them onto the appropriate outpatient clinic within a few days. Before you let the patient go, remember to instruct them to avoid blowing their nose. If the antrum is breached, as it often is with fractured zygomas, then blowing the nose can push air out of the antrum and underneath the skin causing a subcutaneous emphysema and this can become infected. Bear in mind that treatment of a fractured zygoma should ideally be done within two weeks so make sure you book the patient into clinic in good time so this can be achieved. This is the wording for a typical consent form for treatment of a fractured zygoma. Historically Gillies lifts were performed with no internal fixation but these days plating of a fracture is much more common and the patient should be consented for this eventuality. Lifting a zygoma back into position should decompress the infraorbital nerve but there is absolutely no guarantee that numbness in the distribution of this nerve will improve and the patient should be warned of this. In addition, after open reduction and internal fixation of a zygoma there is a risk of around 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 2,000 in developing a retrobulbar hemorrhage which can lead to loss of vision in the affected eye. This is a rare occurrence but the patient must be warned of this. A retrobulbar hemorrhage is an emergency because if it is not treated quickly blindness in the affected eye will ensue. Bone is a living tissue and will bleed when damaged and a retrobulbar hemorrhage occurs when bleeding from the bone tracks into the orbit and accumulates between the cone of extraocular muscles and because the orbit is a rigid compartment the intraorbital pressure increases. Classically this causes pain behind the eye, proptosis and decreasing visual acuity. The globe itself will feel hard to touch and the increase in pressure compresses the retinal artery and damages the optic nerve which left untreated will lead to irreversible blindness. Retrobulbar hemorrhage is usually painful but beware when examining patients with depressed conscious levels or under the influence of alcohol as their reaction to pain may be reduced. This is an axial slice from a CT scan from a patient with a retrobulbar hemorrhage. Notice how the globe position on the left side is anterior when compared to the right. Also notice the opacity within the orbit which extends to its apex. This is a collection of blood and it is this that must be drained immediately. If a retrobulbar hemorrhage is suspected, call your second on call immediately. Whilst waiting for him or her to arrive, commence medical treatment. Providing there are no contraindications, give dexamethasone, acetazolamide and mannitol in these doses. Mannitol is an osmotic diuretic and it is wise to insert a urinary catheter as well. Medical management will hopefully slow the process down, but ultimately the patient needs decompression of the orbit. This can be done at the chair side with an awake patient using a lateral canthotomy but you should also alert the emergency theatre because a patient will need formal decompression. The involvement of ophthalmology will also be required. This photograph shows the incision for a lateral canthotomy. An incision is made of the lateral canthus and quick dissection down the lateral aspect of the orbit is performed. The cone of muscles can then be penetrated with a blunt instrument to liberate the collection of blood. 
Mid-face fractures occur when part of the facial skeleton becomes completely detached. These usually occur with forces in excess of a punch and as such are usually seen where repeated blows to the face have been sustained or a high velocity of injury has occurred, for example a road traffic collision. If you see a bilateral fracture zygoma on an occipitomental view, then be suspicious that this may in fact be a Lefort fracture. Around 20% of mid-face fractures have a concurrent head injury, so bear this in mind before accepting a patient. The Lefort classification for mid-face fractures is not ideal, but it is the best we have. The Lefort 1 is a low-level fracture just above the tooth-bearing maxilla. It involves the pterygoid plates posteriorly and runs anteriorly through the maxillary antrum to the piriform aperture of the nose. The Lefort 2 fracture runs through the pterygoid plates posteriorly and then runs anterosuperiorly to involve the orbital floor and centrally across the bridge of the nose. The Lefort 3 fracture represents complete separation of the mid face from the cranial base. The fracture runs through the superior aspects of the pterygoid plates, through the lateral wall of the orbits and the ZF suture, as well as the bridge of the nose in the midline. A Lefort fracture may occur in combination or at different levels on both sides, and comminuted fractures are common. If the mid face or maxilla is detached, then you may be able to rock this by grasping the anterior maxilla between your thumb and fingers and gently rocking it. Occlusal irregularities occur, as they do in the fractured mandible. Inspect the inside of the mouth for sulcus hematomas, bruising of the palate or a palatal split. Generally speaking, you should admit mid-face fractures. On the ward, commence analgesia, intravenous antibiotics and ask the nurses to perform regular neurological observations. You should discuss this admission with your second on call. You will see plenty of zygomatic fractures, and most can be booked for review on an outpatient clinic. Always be sure to warn the patient not to blow their nose. You must be able to recognise a retroborbar haemorrhage and know the medical treatment for this. Orbital fractures in children must be taken seriously, and you must involve your second on call in these cases.